So um, some of you may recall a um, comment in the back of Marketing Week that was made by Mark Ritson back in November of last year. Um, and essentially this is a comment that's based on uh, an item in the TLS Digital Life Report from December of 2011. Um, and effectively what that um, report said was that round about 60% of users on social networking did not see the social network as a place where they want to integrate with brands. Um, now, the conclusion that Mark drew from this has some merit. There is some legs in what he's saying. People that bought into the idea that if you bought into Facebook with 800 million users, um, you are going to start to see significant amounts of e-commerce revenue coming through are actually finding out that that isn't the case. However, what we need to do is we need to look at the corollary to this, which is that if 61% of users don't want to integrate with Facebook, what the report didn't actually come out and say was that 40-odd percent of um, users of Facebook actually don't mind whether the brand um, interacts with them or not, and in fact are quite willing to interact with the brand. Now that isn't to say that you've got a target market of 40% of 800 million Facebook users, uh, and it isn't to say that you've got a target of 40% of 300 million Twitter users, but it does mean that despite some of the negativity that's starting to surround uh, Facebook commerce, there is still a lot of potential, a lot of room within the marketplace. So if you take that 40%, um, as a large proportion of the market and you compare it to your average e-commerce rates which outside of food and wine retailing are somewhere between two and seven percent uh, for each visitor that comes to your website if you look at it in terms of for those of you that are running multi-channel look at it in terms of high street footfall it's still a very significant amount of market that you want to be looking at so the important thing we're finding with social commerce is, is to understand that it's not actually new. It's an extension of how retailers have retailed for a long, long time. Shopping commerce has always been social. It's only recently when we started to invent for ourselves e-commerce that it became a little bit less social, a little bit more of a solitary activity for people. The fact is people have always enjoyed shopping trips with friends, they've always enjoyed making recommendations to each other, offering advice, commenting in various ways on what people have purchased, suggesting other things that people can buy to go with purchases. And what we're finding is that introducing elements of social back into commerce has produced significant increases in conversion rates and also in shopper engagement. Now, if you look at the um, e-retailing group survey from the middle of 2011, approximately 61% of online shoppers always or would usually read a review before making any kind of a significant new purchase. So this idea of reviews, ratings, recommendations coming through are very important. And in fact, e-consultancy from 2009 said that around about 90% of social network users explicitly trusted a recommendation that was made by a friend or a member of their family. That doesn't quite extend to acquaintances, but it does give you a very large proportion of people that are able to promote products. So a place like Facebook where people are sharing endorsements, they're sharing their finds, they're expressing their discoveries and their opinions with the rest of their social network is one of the best places to start to capitalize on what you're already doing which is using your ratings and reviews and we found that where a brand facilitates the use of uh, social networking on their stores where they encourage people to like to share to start to use the new facebook verbs then they get a significant increase in traffic coming from facebook back to either their e-commerce site or indeed to their mobile commerce sites as well so what we have within Facebook is this huge latent and growing demand for social commerce. It's not here yet, and I don't want to give anybody the impression that social commerce is something that's going to take off like a rocket. It's going to be a long, slow burn. And in fact, I think if you're looking for a model for where the social commerce market is going to be, then you probably wouldn't do too bad to look at where the mobile commerce marketplace has come from. We've seen a lot of significant um, similarities between how people have started to shop on mobile and how they're starting to shop on, on, on social. So what we're seeing is across all of the sites that are on the vendor platform, Facebook is the fastest growing referrer of traffic. 
it's not as big as Google. It doesn't generate as many hits as Google does. But in terms of the growth that we're getting from Facebook, it's much, much greater than we're seeing from Google. And in fact, the only um, traffic referrer we're seeing that's rivaling Facebook in terms of growth at the moment is Pinterest. So that's another one that you may want to be starting to have a look at. So what this latent demand represents is a huge opportunity for you to convert the interaction shoppers have with each other on Facebook into some real hard sales. And if you take a look at what Jimmy Chu has seen there, their conversion rates from Facebook referrals are higher than they get from any other referral source. So the opportunity applies to luxury products, products that have got inherently more value, more desirability, as much as they do to potentially the smaller reactive impulse type purchases. So it's important to remember when you're starting to sell within Facebook that, these, that it's, it's not a shopping mall, it's a social place. And what you need to do is you need to respect that the customers that are on Facebook, the people that are shopping on Facebook, are actually there to engage in conversations in their own social environment. So you may have seen in a lot of the marketing magazines and on quite a few of the blogs recently that the, the aim of the brand is to engage in a conversation on Facebook. The point is that you cannot easily initiate that conversation on Facebook. And if you try to initiate it through interruption type marketing, which is what we're typically used to doing, then there's a good chance that you're going to start to alienate and put people off of your Facebook brand. So what we have found is that discrete product advertisements that are offer-based and are very relevant to the person that's viewing the page are very, very helpful. They help to drive customers across to your e-commerce store, your Facebook store, or even up onto your mobile store. However, the important thing to bear in mind is that they're used by customers as an orientation tool. The conversion rate from adverts on Facebook is not as great as the conversion rate is from a like or a recommendation or a referral from somebody within the social network. So it's, it's a part of what you're doing, but it's not the answer to what you're doing. So essentially what we have to do is we have to respect the fact that selling to shoppers is not the primary aim of Facebook. And it's not, buying is not the primary reason why people go onto Facebook. So what we need to do is to make sure that we manage the interactions with the customers well, we manage the propositions and the um, promotions to the customers well, and make sure that shopping with you is seen to be a strong ancillary benefit of working within the social network rather than an intrusion that's being forced onto customers. So we think it's most important that what you're trying to do is to optimise the experience for your shoppers. You want to make it easy as possible for your shoppers to follow the links, follow the recommendations, follow the reviews, and to actually get to the product information that is being reported by their social network. So there's no point if somebody says, I've just been out and bought this absolutely fantastic red dress. You give them a link to a like page which takes them to your, your main landing page or an offers or promotion page. You have to go to that specific product to get the customer to engage. Because otherwise, all you're doing is you're taking that interest in that product and putting an obstacle in the way of the customer finding out more about it. So having done that, you need to be thinking about um, the pervasiveness that Facebook actually has. And what we found, this, these stats up here are from um, TechCrunch. 60% of people of college age and 40% of middle-aged shoppers are already logged into Facebook when they visit an e-commerce store. Okay, so they've been to Facebook, they've come away from Facebook, they've opened up a new tab, a new window, whatever it happens to be, maybe they haven't logged out of Facebook, but they are still inherently logged into Facebook. So you've got this pervasiveness of Facebook that's following this huge potential marketplace wherever they happen to go for their shopping. So what you want to be doing is to use that fact that they are logged in to remove the friction from the shopping process. So you want to get rid of any obstacles such as registration. And it's particularly frustrating for me if I go onto um, a Facebook um, page, find out about a product, go to that website, and it's one that I've dealt with before, to find out that I'm now being asked to register with that site before I complete a transaction. I would like you to be able to take the information that you already have about me in your e-commerce system, your CRM system, and utilize that as part of the shopping process. So take that friction out of registration as much as you can. Take it out of the login, take it out of giving details about shipping and payments and what have you and make sure that what you're doing is you're using the Facebook APIs to integrate the login into your social, com sorry, into your e-commerce or your mobile commerce store. It's not a difficult thing to do technically, 
Um, and most platforms, I believe, like Vendor, already have that capability built in within it. So the key thing to emphasize that we found about Facebook is it's the worst place in the world that you can possibly mess up. If you take a customer to a non-existent offer, if you take them to an unavailable product that's out of inventory, if you uh, underestimate the demand that a promotion has, basic, basic, simple mistakes, what is going to happen is the customers will instantly react. They will instantly post, they will instantly make a comment on your page, on their page, through the messaging, what have you. There is no incentive within Facebook for the customer to stop, open up an email, write an email, send that email off to you. That just doesn't happen. It's an instinctive blind reaction that customers have. So you have to be absolutely 100% meticulous about how you're working within the Facebook space. The second thing is to make sure that you don't expose your customers to any security risks at all. The key thing to remember about Facebook is it has not grown up as a shopping environment. Therefore, if you're asking people to pass credit card information through the Facebook interface, you need to make absolutely sure that that is being handled in a PCI compliant way. Okay? That's not a, a, a statement from us, that's a statement that's coming back from all of the credit card companies as well. If you're going to be taking data through whatever mechanism it is, it has to be PCI compliant. So whatever process that you're using to process this information, you need to make sure that your customers are very aware that the information is being handled correctly and it's being handled in the right way. Bear in mind that anything that goes wrong with security on Facebook is guaranteed to instantly backfire. It will blow up in your face instantaneously. So you need to be 100% certain of what you're doing with that. So the, the key thing there, secure your payment flow to the minimum PCI standards. The other good practice is to secure any customer information that you have. Their registration details, their shipping details, what they've looked at, what they've liked, what they've found. anything that you have that is coming back into your CRM system, you need to make sure that is equally as protected as the payment data itself. Okay? It may seem like a little bit of overkill, but remember, people are very, very sensitive in the social space to the security risks. So you need to go that extra level to protect it. So the key thing there is to make sure that when a customer is adding something to the basket, when they're checking out, that they understand clearly what process they are going to be going through. So all of the good work that you've done on your e-commerce site, your mobile site, about educating customers about how secure their data is going to be, how you handle it, how you look after it, what your risk mitigations are, all the rest of this good stuff that you do, you need to make sure you're doing that with spades as far as the Facebook environment is concerned. So what you then have within Facebook is an opportunity to reward and influence further the key influencers within the marketplace. This has always been a marketer's dream is to identify the people that get other people to buy and then incentivize and motivate them to do this. And this is now very, very possible. There's a real benefit to implementing loyalty campaigns and referral and recommendation campaigns within the Facebook environment. Um, Ticketmaster last year said that for each event that somebody likes, for each ticket that they purchase, for each recommendation for an event or a ticket that they get, they generate an additional four pounds worth of revenue. Now it may not sound like a significant amount, but bear in mind that we're talking about an additional four pounds on top of a purchase that's probably around about 60 to 70 pounds as an average basket value anyway. So what you then have is a really strong, powerful selling channel. In other words, you've got the shoppers that have bought from you are selling on your behalf to other people. It costs you nothing, unless you're going to go over the top with your loyalty campaigns, but it generates significant real attributable value. Now, I'll come on a little bit more, uh, a little bit later on to where, where that value is. A very cost-effective marketing channel, and what you want to be doing is to go even further and integrate your social network and your CRM. So you want to be thinking about pulling in your loyalty points, your referral rewards, um, you want to be thinking about light gating particular offers for particular customers. Um, you need to be thinking about offering preview sales, this kind of thing. Essentially what you're doing is you're rewarding people for purchasing from you within a social environment for recommending and referring within that social environment as well. So beyond that, what we're looking at doing is removing the kind of um, registration login hurdles by using this cross-channel CRM. Now it's really important that we understand here that 
Facebook social networking is an inherently mobile environment. Most people are accessing their Facebook pages or their social networking pages through some form of a mobile device, either a smartphone or to a lesser extent via um, tablet technology. So you need to understand that if you're going to ask somebody to like, to make a recommendation, to make a referral, what you're also going to have to do is to make sure that they can be satisfied on the device that they're looking at. Okay? So there's no point in taking somebody from your Facebook page on a mobile phone to an e-commerce site which is browser based and doesn't fit into the form factor that they've got in their hand. You need to make sure that you're integrating it back into your mobile commerce site as well. So having done that and made sure that you've got this integration into your CRM, what you are then able to do is to create some very highly personalised offers and experiences for your customer. Now that starts off with a very fundamental thing of I've come to you from a Facebook site, I'm using my mobile phone, last time I came on you've remembered who I am because you've got all my login details, my information, my credentials and now you can start to sell to me easily and effectively. You're not going to ask me to log in, you're not going to ask me to re-register, you're not going to ask me. You can even go to the point of saying last time you came you had some things in the basket we make you a proposal to clear that basket out, buy that basket, and add some more things to it. But it does require that integration between your e-commerce system, your social commerce system, your mobile commerce, and also your CRM system. The other thing we need to be thinking about is how do we integrate this back into the store? Because we said right at the beginning of the presentation that shopping is a social thing. It's wrong to exclude the store if you're running a retail operation from use within the social networking as well. So what can you do to encourage people to use the social side of their interactions to go into the store and add things to the basket, give you the opportunity to upsell and cross-sell as well by offering them things like unique vouchers or unique offers, unique proposals. So how are you actually going to personalise these offers and experience? What you're going to be doing is you're going to be capturing data around how people are using the, the uh, social network, how they're using Facebook, how they're using the e-commerce store, how is it using the mobile commerce. So that's an inherent part of working with e-commerce. But the key thing to remember is that in a social environment, people will give you richer information than you're likely to get from quite simply running exit surveys or satisfaction surveys or getting somebody in the call centre to follow up on inquiry or a, a complaint from a customer. And that information doesn't necessarily fall into um, statistical information, but it does give you an understanding of how that individual person is going to interact with your social environment, with your store environment, with your um, e-commerce environment. That allows you then to take that information and to formulate a unique offer present them product recommendations, uh, look at their social network and say, well, other people that are like you were interested in these things as well, so maybe you're going to be interested in them. Take information about what they purchased in one channel and say, hey, recently you bought this. Wouldn't this belt look great with it? Wouldn't this hat go fine with it? You bought these shoes. Wouldn't you like this bag to go with it? So you can get these cross-channel recommendations coming back. So I just want to explain um, very briefly where um, we are with um, Facebook at the moment. There is, a, as I alluded right at the beginning of the presentation, an awful lot of um, hype and hyperbole about social commerce and about the value that's inherent within it. And as I said um, along the way, it isn't something that's just going to happen overnight and it's not something that you can generate quite simply by opening up a Facebook store and expecting people to start shopping from it. We are working at the moment with a number of um, key retailers and we keep adding retailers to, to this um, group to try and find out what the real value and the real potential of um, e-commerce, uh, sorry, of e-commerce is. And the first thing we're finding is that to treat the uh, Facebook environment as being just another form of e-commerce is going to lead you down the path to failure. It isn't the same as e-commerce. It's very much driven by promotions, by the social network, by the offers, by the incentives. So what you need to be thinking about in terms of your marketing strategy is how are we actually going to generate the traffic to that particular product page and what's the best thing for us to do with it? Is the best thing for us to satisfy, complete the purchase within the Facebook environment or is the best thing for us to move that customer out of the Facebook environment into our e-commerce or into our, into our mobile environment. That's a strategic decision that you need to make based on the kind of products that you're offering and the kind of customers that you're selling to. 
But what we're trying to do with this experiment is to try and come up with some real hard statistical data because, the, frankly, there isn't any out there at the moment. There's a lot of people who said we've got Facebook commerce stores and a lot of people who we would normally have expected to make a lot of noise about how much they were selling through their Facebook stores simply haven't been. And in fact, what we're seeing in the US is a lot of customers are starting to retrench back from Facebook and starting to reinvest in mobile and more into the e-commerce. And those typically are the retailers that has made the mistake of taking their e-commerce store, putting it into Facebook, and that's it, treating it as being one of the same. It simply isn't. But the thing is, we need to know how do we actually get Facebook to work. So we're running through um, a number of experiments, and all of the retailers um, that are coming onto the, the, the vendor Facebook store um, have agreed that the information will be anonymized, but it will be um, shared back with the, the wider marketplace. So the first thing we're doing is we're, we're saying to ourselves, let's generate a whole series of use cases, and then let's measure those use cases and see what is the best way to get them to work. And in, indeed, do they actually work at all? So we're looking for um, information around registration, making an easy registration, making an easy login, making a simple checkout process. How much impact does that actually have on conversion rates? What does that do as far as basket abandonment, abandonment rates are concerned? What does it do in terms of getting people to come back into the store and re-engage with you a second, a third, a fourth time? In other words, how does it increase the engagement with you? So we're also looking at the value of increasing the levels of engagement. So at the moment, most of us, I'm pretty sure, if we're running an e-commerce store of any kind, have got the ability for somebody to click on a little like icon or a little Twitter icon or, or whatever the case happens to be. That's taken it to one level. But how are we going to get it to the next level? And what's the value in actually investing in the technology and in the marketing approaches that are needed to get it to the point where you're asking the customer not just to like it but to actively recommend it to actively promote it to actually engage in it to get loyalty benefits and rewards back from it we're looking also at the issue around having a significantly large fan base or a significantly large twitter following if you're looking at twitter as a, uh, a channel for driving revenue it was said recently and i can't for the life remember who said it but apparently um, if you don't have a million fans on facebook then you're wasting your time as far as Facebook commerce and Facebook media is concerned. That actually is probably correct if you're doing it on the basis of here's an e-commerce store, let's try and use the same old things to drive through it. But if you're starting to look at specific targets within that, then a much, much smaller customer base, a much, much smaller fan base is probably going to be likely. We're thinking probably around about 450, 500,000 fan mark will start to generate significant levels of um, e-commerce traffic for you. However, we don't know that for sure. So what we're going to be doing is looking at various ways that you can build the fan base up, looking at the threshold levels, and even going to the point of saying, well, what happens if we happen to effectively buy an engagement, buy an endorsement, buy a fan base? What's the value and potential return of a celebrity endorsement as far as Facebook is concerned? We're also looking at the, the, the the valency in incentivizing and rewarding users. So basically taking a subset of customers and saying, hey, you know, this, this A group over here, we're going to incentivize and reward for doing certain things, for buying, for promoting the purchase, for liking, for recommendations, for writing reviews, um, from, from, for rating things even. And then we're going to take the B group over here and we're going to run a split test on it and say they're going to get nothing. We're going to see what the conversion rates are, what, what, what kind of revenues you get back from them, what the basket sizes and abandonment rates happen to be. Um, we're also going to be looking at the um, effect of increasing um, likes on your brand through offering exclusive offers and promotions from outside of the Facebook environment. We know pretty well that if you get a like, then people are going to follow up on that like, it's going to generate traffic. But what does it do as far as increasing your SEO and the pull-in from the wider e-commerce marketplace? So we're running a series of experiments around that. And then finally, what we've said is you know, this, this frictionless purchasing is absolutely essential. But in order to make the investment in the technology and the processes and the, the methodologies to make this work, you're going to have to make some significant investment. So we're trying to build up a business case that says if we have a frictionless PCI compliant purchase process that can start in a Facebook store and terminate there or go to an e-commerce site and terminate there or go to a mobile commerce site and it's secure and it's reliable and it's promoted as such, what's that going to do for the basket values, for the conversion rates and for the sales that you're generating? So these um, experiments um, are just getting underway at the moment. Um, 
we are expecting that we'll be able to start releasing some information about that um, sometime in the next um, month to six weeks or so. And as I say, it's a, it's a living experiment. It's something that we're planning to keep going for some considerable time. So, as I said, we're going to share that data. Um, we're not going to tell you who the retailers are, but we're going to um, anonymise it. But we will tell you what market sectors they are in, so you've got a fairly good idea about it. Um, if you want to register for more information about that, go to uh, vendor.com forward slash like me. Scan the QR code there. Um, either one of those will get you to the same destination. There's a white paper there that you can download that gives you some um, thinking about it. And uh, if you have the time during the day, uh, we're on stand 2044, which is just over there next to the mobile theatre um, presentation room. So by all means, feel free to um, stop by and ask us any more questions.